lots of coals every year. We are a big buyer in the mountain, 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 mountain market. So they want to set up a coal business in Taiwan. They want to become the trader in Taiwan to sell coal to like uh, FPG, Taisu Chi. They have uh, IPP in Maya. IPP means independent power plant. They import coal, they burn coal, generate electricity, and they sell to TPC. TPC is a Taiwan power company, uh, Taidian. And Taidian is also a big buyer of all the market. And they want to set up a business because before that, it don't show me do coal business domestically. They buy uh, coal from Russia, Indonesia, Australia, uh, South Africa, and they import to Japan. And since they have the knowledge, they have the, the know-how, mm -hmm. they want to do business in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. I was a newbie in the company, and whenever there's something nobody actually knows, they will assign a newbie to do. Believe in no matter what kind of company you join, they will assign you the one who the others don't want to do. You have to suck your own. So get prepared yourself. <laughs> I feel I was killing their trades. <laughs> and luckily, I think I have a very good, uh, I would say, the, the procurement team, especially, especially the leader in for uh, FPG, he really likes me. So whenever I, I go, because in Taiwan, you want to sell coal to FPG or TBC, you don't directly just sell to them. You need to participate via the tender. The tender means like, not like a beef tender, but like a neuro and run a tender, like, like a bill man. You have to bid an offer. And no matter what, when they issue a tender, you have to run through all the document. They will specifically ask you to prepare all the document in a certain serial and they ask you to like step all the paper or use a paper. Like in Japan. I forgot to mention in Japan. When you want to apply to a company, sometimes they want you to handwrite in your CV, including your motive, how why you want to apply this job in your company. And including your uh, academic background and your uh, no, no. former career background and your name, everything in handwriting. I don't know, I'm not sure this couple of years. Huh? Uh, do they still do my Tegaki event show? No? Uh, I think most of the people don't do that. Oh, okay. Uh, because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> Back to my time. Still a lot of companies they ask us to write in. If you have a typo, you cannot use a correction pen. You have to rewrite the whole thing all over again. Hmm. So you will see the junior guy, uh, the junior student or senior students before they graduate, their the left hand is like much bigger than their left hand. <laughs> it's all because of that. So some of them they will write about ten uh, hundred pieces of them just in order to apply a job. Hmm. Okay, back to the whole stuff. And you have uh, this kind of thing. But all the information they are willing to disclose in the uh, tender document is very limited. You have to try to call them or set up a meeting with them, try to ask them some key information like uh, what's the lake-in? So called lake is like the shipping window. Uh, you have to come within this period, within these two weeks or something like that. But in the beginning doc uh, in the tender document they will always tell you two months. But if you know the actual lake-in, uh, lake is like this. It's not proper English. Uh, it's just inside the. Okay. This is called Lakin. If you are interested in tra commonly trading, uh, you can free to ask me anything to after this. Uh, Lakin is a shipping Lakin. Uh, shipping window when you need to get the cargo arrive in 
at the port in Taiwan. Mm. It's a uh, design it, this kind of things. But if you really have a very healthy and good relationship, like brothers, then sometimes they can disclose the information under the table. <laughs> this is a thing I really, I was really keen on uh, realizing, trying to actualize this kind of relationship. This also helped me to find a job after, uh, when I want to go to Singapore. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky. I helped them to build up the whole business. We start from zero, nothing, in the early 2016. And by the end of 2016, we actually delivered 1.6 million tons to them. That's actually more than 10 vessels. But it depends because each vessels like cap or handicap or higher this a very professional words I don't think you need to know. But it's just like every tender is important and I help them to build the business. And one day I realized because they asked me to be training in their Singapore office. Singapore is actually the hub for financial and for commodity trading. And actually commodity trading is quite bonded with the financial stuff because they are futures. Uh, Futures means like Qihuo. Like you can swap the cargo and everything. That's quite complicated stuff. But anyway, uh, you realize my signature. Okay? And <laughs> I trained in Singapore for two weeks to know all the relevant and uh, necessary information about cold trading. And I realized. Wow, those cold traders in Singapore, they already made this kind of money here. And I still earn this little in Taiwan, how come I need to Taham? So I started looking for a job in Singapore for cold trading. But it's very, very hard because it's quite competitive. You have to realize outside, not just Taiwan, in the world, every industry, you want to have a job, is very, very competitive, especially after the pandemic. Yeah. So at first I just, okay, let's find a job in Singapore at first. Then we see if there's any appropriate opening or timing, then I can jump to another company. So at first I joined a company called Inabata. At first I didn't know there's a trading company called Inabata. It's quite third tier of trading company in Japan. They are doing the plastic and chemical only. And if I joined that, this is a very good story to share because my my boss, uh, usually in Japanese company, overseas branch, they would assign the Japanese to be the boss in the team. Each team has a Japanese boss. So at first, if you're a French man to a society, you find a Japanese company, you find your well paid than the other Taiwanese company, but there's a seal in there. To be honest, because all the important position they will assign Japanese to come here and to dominate you. Yeah, that's uh, uh, the truth, the fact. But whether you decide what kind of career you want to have, it doesn't matter or not, it's up to you. It's just a fact I want to share. So I have a Japanese boss, uh, his name is Tanaka. And after I joined, I found out, wow. Well, he really is a notorious guy because no one likes him. And he like torture, he's very fond of torturing everyone. Hmm. My daily life is like, we travel quite a lot. It's not in the office all the time. But when he's on the plane, even he doesn't have the Wi-Fi, he will keep trying to look through all your emails or all the emails you send out with him in the CC, in the room. He will reply you. And after he landed, when he got the internet connection, then all the things he stored in the draft will just suddenly set up all the time. <laughs> then it's like midnight when he arrived in Japan and I was about to sleep. Then it was like, dun, 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 you won't go and all the way. 
and he would like call me 24-7 whenever he wants. And every day I was in office, he would just call me in front of everyone, even if it's not my fault, even if it's the assistant's fault, he would say, you should monitor that, how come you did that? Mm. But of course it depends. So the thing I want to tell is like, um, how could I, I am to like, bear all the torture I did it because back to the time I think I'm already ill, mentally ill. I need to, I need to see some like, uh, the, the strength, strength yeah. to heal all the, the mental pain. So you have to realize sometimes you find a job you think you are, you can do it, but within the job scope actually the thing is you can handle, but maybe there's something hidden somewhere. Be, not stated in the, the, the job scope, the job description, and you cannot find it within the interview. Even they have two or three or four interview with you, you couldn't find it. Only after you join a company, you realize, oh, your, back, your boss is there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is the thing you, you also need to try that. So that's why, uh, I mentioned earlier you have to be uh, good enough. Autonomous uh, don't go for me, come on. Alright, don't take us there. So, you need to really find a way how to de stress, to release the pressure, or you even find a good way how to make your ball stop bullying you. But go in front of him not after him yeah. and he probably is already prepared to have this kind of attack but this another thing I should be sharing with you <laughs> so I went there I working for around almost a year and thank God there's a co-trading uh, company who used to be my competitors they find out I'm also in Singapore so they try to uh, contact me. They try to find my name on LinkedIn. They try to contact me because they are desperate to do business with MPG and TPC. So they find me and they offer me, and I was I got a twenty percent increment compared to how I get paid in in Abata. And this is the first time I get rid of the Japanese companies, and I feel like. <laughs> very, very comfortable. You don't need to like touch it or touch it up. By touching or touch it up, because in Singapore usually they don't like ask you to. In Japanese we call it takoku. Uh, then you have to like tap your company car to some machine and to keep records, mm. records about what time you come to the office and what time you leave the office. In Singapore they don't do this kind of things. I think. All the job beside in about the uh, two other working experiences in Singapore, including this culture companies. They will say their office hour is like nine to six, but usually people come in nine thirty with their breakfast and they will leave around six just punctually, mm. just on time. They will say, Oh, I thought let's go get a uh, let's go get breakfast a few. It's okay. Uh, let's go grab a beer, a uh, crop key or somewhere. This is their lifestyle, but you still need to fulfill what your boss asks you to do. But they are not very like uh, uh, asking you to abide by the formality or the company rule. They are a little bit rules and compare Japanese companies. But how about in Japan? Hey guys, time to van more, okay? And, and in Japan, when I was working there, they say the, the company, uh, the office hour is 9 to 6. Usually you need to come by like F45. If you come by 8.55, you will think, how come you can start working from 9? You go to toilet, then you have your coffee, then you turn on your your computer, then it's already past nine. So usually the, the, 
the atmosphere in the office, they will make you to come earlier and get yourself prepared. Then right before night, you're already like keen replying emails. And usually in Japan, they will stay a little bit late in the office to whether they are busy or not busy, they will try to get some stuff. They don't just leave like on time. But usually in Japan, I think most of the job is quite hardcore. They, they are overloaded, I think. So everyone just like, Kirihi Mate. Kirihi means like, already like, about to hit the throat and dare to do other things. So if you want to go to Japan to have a job, you have to get yourself prepared with this kind of business environment there in Japan. But in Singapore, they also have a lot of pressure because it's a very small country, but they have they are quite highly paid, so they are asked to hit the target every year. The target, I mean, KPI. So in Japan, it's more like like when I was working in Tokyo, even I didn't even I didn't hit my target. I didn't feel my KPI. I still get a quite good bonus because this they consider the bonus as a teamwork. So in Tokyo, they will have a formula. Uh, calculate your bonus, but if you put the words, the font in 10 and you print it out with an effort, it's going to it's going to occupy occupy half of the paper because the formula is too long. So eventually, whether you work super hard or not, everyone is going to receive the similar amount of bonus. That's a culture. But in Singapore, they are going to review your performance every year. Every year I see people come and go. Some some people they just let go. Mm -hmm. But I'm more naive. I feel the bonus is not what I want, so I just quit the job and I get back to Taiwan and here I am giving a speech to you. <laughs> but a lot of people out there, they are, they got rechange. Rechange means fire. They got let go and they have to find a job. They have to find a way to sustain their life, have their needs meet. So this the thing I did so far. So okay. Earlier I mentioned I got another job to the project company, but the issue happened. Because in Singapore the visa application is a bit different from Japan. Japan, I graduated from MBA and the company offered me then the company helped me to apply the visa. Then the the Japan government just re, just issue a five year working visa to me. So within that five year, so within the five years, uh, even if I quit the job, I still can stay in Japan. This is not going to be a problem. I still legally to be allowed staying and having a life in Japan until I finish this five years. But in Singapore, your working visa is bonded with your company. Even if you change your job, you have to reapply the visa again. And they will review the company's performance, the headcount. Headcount means the 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 office, the numbers of uh, the number of employees. And they will see how many, how much percent of the employees are uh, local residents, how many of them are foreigners. They have quota. So in Singapore, and they also classify the 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 expatriate workers, like whether you are uh, able to be entitled with a EP, EP is the highest rank. It means like you are a professional, you actually have a degree, and your 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 monthly salary is certainly above the number. Last time when I firstly went to Singapore, the EP's qualification is like three thousand six hundred Singapore dollars. dollars. But now the EP qualification is much higher than that because the 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 competitiveness 
in Singapore for finding a job. And also the local people already started complaining like Singapore government allowed too much people, uh, too many people overseas come to work in Singapore. It became an issue. So they're increasing the criteria of the, of the salary. And the second is SP. SP means skilled. You are skilled, but your pay is not high enough that you are okay to allow to get an SP. But SP, the difference between EP and SP is just quite limited. Is whether because if I um, I have a company, I hire with Ouyang Chenzhen, an EP, then uh, the company doesn't need to bear anything more. But if I hire him as an SP, the company has to pay for the lady to it's some kind of like in my understanding it's some kind of like a penalty you hire a expatriate instead of local people so you have to pay extra money to the government it's not on top of his salary it's like extra the company has to pay extra money to the, to the government it's around like three hundred to six hundred six dollars yeah, but how come the Singapore companies, no matter if it's a local company or MNCs, how come they want to hire someone outside Singapore? It's because if they hire the, the Singaporean or the local uh, permanent residents, we call that show R, uh, PR in short. Uh, like I pay a Singaporean 1000 a month. The Singaporean has to pay 7%, uh, 70% of his salary as a CPF. Uh, CPF, anything is just money, to the, a certain fund organization. And the government will keep the 70% of your monthly salary as a deposit until you retire. And but the, the interest record is like 2%, 2 to 3%. They help you to save money as long as you start working for them. But 70% is not quite, actually quite a lot. Huh? Mm -hmm. But the company has to pay 20% on top of the 1,000 also to CPF. So if you, if you are making, you are doing a job with a monthly salary of 1,000, actually 370 is going to be deposited to the CPF. Mm. Then you keep saving the monthly with 2% uh, interest rate until you retire. But of course you can use it before you retire. There's only three ways you can use it. One is mortgage. For mortgage is not for car, it's for how the house loan you are paying. And the second is medical use. Uh, you have a fight with your you have a fight with your wife and your wife cut you, then your, your hospital life is then you have to pay the medical bill. You can use your CPF to pay the medical uh, bill. And the last is you have to you want to study further, you enroll to a master's degree, you can use a CPF to pay for a tuition. This is the thing. So the local companies, they want to hire a spectrum because whether it's like EP or SP, even they have to pay for the AD, it doesn't matter because they don't have to pay for the 20% of CPF for the employees if it's a uh, foreigner. But now the environment changes. Huh? Yeah. Thing. So the co comp the co train company they have an issue because the performance of the company isn't good enough. Even they have a headcount for a company to hire foreigners. But I didn't get the working visa. But the, the deal we made is like I stay in Taiwan for two months. After two months, I go to Singapore for one month. They they have a, because most. Most of the coal came from Indonesia to Taiwan. They have an office in Jakarta. Uh, I go stay in Jakarta for a month as a tourist visa. Then I can go.
compared to Taiwan. I was still in there for around a, a year. Until the, my last job, my former job, RG, they offered me. And RG is a company which is quite big. The founder is a Chinese Indonesian. Uh, they already converted to Singaporean citizenship. And RG is doing like paper making uh, and palm oil and LNG and some fiber and stuff. They are actually quite a big company with 60,000 60, employees around the world. They have the factories in Brazil, China, uh, Indonesia, and the headquarters in Singapore. I got hired by then, so if we back to the If my office is around here. This is UOB Plaza. I was working here. Mm. Yeah. So I got hired by them and pay is uh, a little bit better than the culture and companies and the work welfare and everything. And because in Singapore we are not uh, expatriate workers is not entitled to join their national insurance system. So the company uh, is subject to a company decision whether they're going to insure you or you have to bear the cost. But RG is quite big, so they cover my insurance everything. So that's also the deal we met when we were negotiating the, the package about my, my pay and salary and everything. And I joined them because they want to set up the biomass trading uh, business. They want someone to help them to set up the logistic and commercial and have a deal with Japanese buyers and they can earn the profit. So they look through my CV. This is a thing after you have a couple years of working experience. They look through your CV. Oh, Titan used to be working for shipping companies and he has some some experience, uh, some experience in training companies, he knows about logistics, he knows how to negotiate the contract, the pricing negotiating and everything, then he can help us. And he also speak English Mandarin and Japanese. Maybe he can help us to set up a uh, business successfully. Then Okay, that's the thing I started with it. And it also become my, the thing that I actually like to share with people because it's very hard for me. I, I was asked to travel to some countryside in Indonesia by no Taiwanese I've ever been to. We went to a place, by the place I most, um, I, I often visited, it's called Jambi. It's in, in the uh, Sumatra. Island. It's a place I believe no Taiwan has ever been before because when I arrived in Jambi, I'm going to pass a custom. They they asked me to be inside the office because they cannot recognize Taiwanese passport. I was sitting there and I don't speak Bahasa Indonesia. I was so nervous and they at first they don't and they didn't allow me to make any calls. I was just sitting there. And office official would just come and ask me a question in very poor English, and I was totally shocked. I cannot communi communicate with them. So, how are you going to solve this kind of problems? It's not on the job description they show you. You show the requirement and what's the job they ask you to do, but beside the job description, actually, there are a lot of issues that could happen mm -hmm. when you're working for a company. It's also a job. You have to solve the problem for yourself and also for the company. Okay, then I need to secure a warehouse. I don't speak Bahasa, so I have local staff uh, accompanying me to find a place. I talk in English and the staff talk to them in Bahasa, Indonesia, to negotiate how we're going to rent this warehouse. And then I look around the place and see the river, how I get to load the cargo onto the barge and sail to the anchorage, how to 
uh, do a loading operation from the barge to the mother vessel. So, how come I share this kind of information? Is they didn't write it in your in, in the job description for you? What comes along when you are doing the job? So, the the thing is when you're going to join the company during the interview, what kind of question you ask actually matter a lot. What kind of survey you already done for the job you wanted to do for your future? And when you really know about what the job requires a person to handle, how well you can be it all depends on yourself. Actually not the company. They don't really care and they don't really take care of only a person. They'll just write all of the things for you see then say how good the company is and blah 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 blah, blah the company regard everyone fairly and importantly but actually this is just like when your mother asks you did you study today or not then you say yes <laughs> no matter what you've already done yeah it's the same thing so you have to realize the reality outside of work and outside of world and and before you go into enter a uh, industry, how usually this job will require a person to do. It's really, really important. Yeah, this is a thing when you are doing some survey on the industry, the kind of job you wanted to do, and uh, to build some connection with the people actually, but they already inside the industry are really, really helpful for you in the future. Okay, the next is uh, when I was composing this presentation, I, I think it's quite important how you evaluate yourself and how people see you as a person. So to me, my, my personal my personal opinion, I was I would I would check my by in two different ways. One is qualitative and one is quantitative. Qualitative, if, if I already bring the team to do the job successfully and everyone is happy, if I really build a good team, if I really have a work-life balance, if I really doing something or hit the thing that I really want to fulfill, I want to accomplish. This is how uh, a qualitative way. But quantitative, of course, we look at the number of our the our bank account, how much I already saved, the monthly salary, did it, does it come on time every month because I have the credit card payment to pay? Whether the bonus will be good this year or not, or whether if I join this company and the frequency of my business travel can help me to get the VIP membership from the air airline. And to be honest, I'm Singapore Airline Gold Member eh? and yeah, also Galuta Airline Gold Member. Yeah, this is the thing I'm really proud of, even though I cannot fly anywhere right now. Yeah, but this is how you look at yourself. Mm -hmm. But do you think the company will evaluate you in the same way like you do? No. They value at your skills and your potential. Even you fulfill the KPI they ask you to do within 2021, there's still a possibility they may ask you to leave in 2022 mm -hmm. because they see no potential in you. <clears throat> Maybe they, they think, okay, you hit 100%, you already done. And but actually, if we consider further. There's nothing much you can bring to a company. And the chairman has asked the request the HR to reform the organization to let some people go to downsize the workforce to cut some costs on humans. That's the thing you need to worry about. So you don't just like join a company and 
You want to stabilize, you want to just have a very normal, not very high-end, just have a light. But eventually, at some point, you're going to be reviewed by the world, by the society, by the company, by your peers. So what kind of light you really want, it really matters. So like, for example, uh, for my class in, from YZU, uh, one of my classmates, like I mentioned, is an executive director in the Machi Dijia company made by... Okay, you are not going to see, see him, so I can, I, can, I can say he's secret. He made more than $3 million a year in Taiwan. This is quite a lot, 37 years old. And another guy, before we graduated, we asked him, hey, I asked you one, what kind of job you want to do? And he said, I want to go back to Thailand, I want to be a postman, I want to be a your time. And we graduated in 20, 2007, and today, today is 2022, he's still the your time. And he actually got promoted to be a leader. He can be in the office. He don't. He didn't. He doesn't need to ride a bike and send the mails. But he said he refused. I want to ride a bike and send the mails. Mm -hmm. And some of them, they change their career uh, after they graduate. They have a test and enroll to the financing graduate school. Then they become a banker. They are buying, selling stocks in the market. I also have this kind of class. The, the same class, but everyone has different path mm -hmm. for their life. Mm -hmm. But I didn't mean that the postman is like not a good job, but he seems quite fulfilled. Mm -hmm. He's very satisfied. And he's like some kind of like He doesn't need to worry about his life. He just go ride a bike until he's 65 and Time. This is a good thing, he's very happy. But to be honest, I'm a person who is more like I want to show my parents that I actually can do something. So I refused to join the family business. I was always on my own and cherish the friend career. I want to make more money every year. So that's the reason why I quit my job. And at some point, I think Taiwan is doing quite good than the other countries during the early pandemic. But when I came back, then... Okay. <laughs> it didn't turn out well. Yeah. Uh, I was saying the same thing with uh, Magazal san uh, when I was in his office. I saw the, the magazine, San Ye Token. After I came back, at some point, I bought the, the magazine and read the information. After the pandemic, there are 250,000 Taiwanese who used to live overseas that came back after the pandemic. But only half of them found a job. But obviously, most of them may be higher paid and they came back. There's no suitable position for them. Maybe they are too high skilled. Uh, you know, in Taiwan, most of the company are SME. SME means like small, medium uh, entities, like Zhong Chao Chi in Mandarin. Uh, if it's a Zhong Chao Chi SME, most of, them, mostly, most of them are owned by the families. The family business usually are quite discreet. It's very hard to get in and let them to circle you inside the inner circle. We also have to consider about that. And yeah, in my case, because I used to do a commodity trading, and there are not many commodity trading in Taiwan, a shipping company, even though you may hear, they earn like, like the annual bonus is like 40 months, but you have, to think, you have to know one information. Evergreen shipping company, they distribute 40 months of bonus to their employees, but since the financial tsunami and until now, their life is like nightmare. 
within this 10 years. But only to this year, 2020 and 2021, they got to make some profit and eventually benefit their employees. So for the context of bonus, actually we just like compensate all the old times they suffered. Yeah, we are not concerned about that. And I still want to do combined training. And to be honest, after I came back for around here, I look around the environment. I also constantly have interviews while I was doing some freelance job in Taiwan. Uh, after all, I realized I still want to be in Singapore. Uh, and that's the thing I have to change after. I also have my my mission, my my problem to solve. So no matter what kind of what age you hit, you still have some problem. Even you are good at your job, the company pays you well, but maybe in the private, you still have some issues with your family or something like that. So just do all the thing normal in a normal way. Don't be too stressed because I think one of my friend is too stressed. And he has to quit a job and terrorize in the at his home. Then ever since he always stay in the home. And he got no money and his parents are already seventy something and the parents still have to like provide him a life feeding and everything. Yeah. So I think choosing a career is important, but the thing I actually want you to understand is like how to handle the stress because at some point you're going to face it. No matter you're a, a senior manager in the trade company or in a bank, or whether you're a customer service staff in the call center. Or oh, actually, I have a classmate, she's in the call center in China Airline. And every day he, she needs to receive all the complaints from the, the so called VIP, the call member. Then they keep complaining, complaining, complaining. So actually, this kind of my, my classmate, she also suffered a lot and she cannot handle it. At some point, she always wants to quit. This is like a circle. Okay, I, I pass the climax, then I came down and become calm again. Then another time, uh, a lot of uh, customers keep calling and, and my stress become high. It's like a circle. But how you handle the circle is quite important, no matter what kind of job you're going to take. These are things. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, about the interviews, I, I think I didn't refer to any information on the internet. I just like look back to since 2007 until 2022, all the interview I have uh, had in Japan, Taiwan, or Singapore. I think the important, the, the point I would like you to know is this, maybe, of course it's much more I want you to uh, keep it in mind to be focused, but the first thing I come, it came to, came to my mind is cut to the chase. You know, I, like, if I ask you, uh, uh, as a fresh graduate, I ask you, can you introduce yourself in three minutes? Then you start with, uh, I was the second child born in my family, I have two brothers. This kind of question answers I will like, I will roll my eyes to the back. But that was the industry. When I was interviewing some juniors, they would say this kind of pattern. I don't know where they get the idea to say, I'm the second child in my family, I have two brothers. I'm 27 years old. Don't say the thing already on a CV. You just try to condense your background in, like, like a, sum, you just summarize it. Like, even though you don't have any work experience, you can just say, uh, okay, uh, I was from when I was my manager, and within those four years of studies, what did I do? What did you do in those four years? You don't say, uh, I took some course for contractual negotiation, I took the course strategic communication, believe me, the boss don't believe the course you take in the university, like strategic communication, like 
you take the course, you become very good at communication. It's not going to be possible. <laughs> it takes a lot of training and actual experience to make you a good one in the market. Mm -hmm. So just cut to the chase. Pre and be precise and concise because you look consider like I have a friend, girlfriend, she's working as a recruiter in L'Oreal Taipei office, which is in Taipei 101. She has to help the senior recruiter to filter the CV every day. And only one junior executive, there might be three, more than 300 applicants that she has to really do every day. So if you write to details and not very concise and precise, even though you are very potential candidates, they may just roll you out. Mm. So how to write CV is really, really important. You have to spend a lot of time how to compose your CV. To become, because it's the first step to convince the, the company to get to meet you in person. Yeah, And if they want you to come to the office to uh, interview with them, actually they already like you. You just help them to uh, verify you are the person on the CV mm. or you are not. But of course, they have some backup choices, so they are not going to ask only you. They are going to ask another thousands of people to come to office altogether because you are at the same levels. Mm. So, so how to outperform them, it depends on your skills and convince them during the talks you have with them. Yeah, and the thing when I was uh, interviewing with the Japanese company in Japan, I think most of the people remind me is like, don't make gestures. You can see those Amor. Amor in Singapore means foreigners, the Caucasian people, the um, bites of them. They call it Amor, like in Taiwanese Homa, you know. So those Amor, sometimes they talk, they were like, you know all this thing, this thing gone? Like this kind of thing. But if you're in Japan, when you interview with a company, they don't want you to be like very active, phys like physically active. They want you to be very uptight and sit just upright and only one third of the seat and with your hands on the, the knees of the lap. And everyone just wear the same. So, after every time I travel to Japan for business trip, I took all the 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 newbies that are waiting for interview. Everyone took the same. I will always make fun of them and don't panic. Try to be calm. If you feel nervous, actually, you can just tell them I'm nervous. Like at first when I started talking, I so I actually feel quite nervous. Then I will tell you. I'm nervous. After you disclose this information, I think after a couple of minutes you'll feel like, oh, you're less nervous. Mm -hmm. It's quite a good way for me. Huh? And don't exaggerate. Even if you said yourself, you say yourself is a very competitive person, blah 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 blah, but eventually you're not. <laughs> then you're going to be suffering a lot. Mm -hmm. and you know, everyone has his or her own probation. This is a thing you need to worry about. And don't underestimate yourself. Like I said in the beginning, you don't think those graduates from NTU must be outperforming you. They, may, they must be sucking at some places. Yeah, so just focus on yourself. Don't compare to each other, just focus on yourself. Mm -hmm. If you want to compare, then compare yourself with this job. Whether you already qualified with those requirements, the same things. Okay, I think I finished my talk. Here comes a QA, no personal questions, and don't my talk hurt my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> so you can just freely speak any kind of thing. Yeah, go ahead, ask questions and I'm not teachers, I'm not going to rate your points, so it's okay anything you want to ask. Benny, okay, go ahead. So you've had um, your fair share of bad experiences in the workforce, actually. Um, what would you say is a red flag when you apply for a company and then you start 
noticing something based on their interview, would you say that there's something we should avoid as, you know, as a new team? I mean, during an interview, you already feel something is wrong, is it? Your question? Or, yeah. or the company is fishy, something, yeah, so they are hiding something. Maybe, like for example, I was taught like back then, um, if the company says, oh, we're like family here, it's <laughs> like, you <laughs> know. When they say they are family, they are not family. Yeah, like, you should worry about that, like, are there other stuff that you would um, advise us to be? Uh, to be honest, uh, like I said, I'm 30, 38 this year. The only thing I care is about money. <laughs> and I don't care whether they say they are family or not. But I think for you guys, the most important thing for you after you get a job, even you already join this company, you already started uh, reporting to work. Uh, <clears throat> I would suggest you don't to don't skip to the judgment too quickly. You can still monitor because even those bad experiences could be the benefit for your future. How you're going to deal with this kind of bad experience also matters. Like when my Japanese boss, when I was work, uh, the Japanese boss in Imapala, Singapore, he basically told her me every day. And everyone knows, even the Japanese, uh, aside from the headquarters, they don't. But after all, I look at the other side, I look at the right side, everyone treat me better than the others. They said, no, I'm already being tortured. And when I ask something, better it's not from my boss, but I was still say, hey, clear. I need the report quickly because the son is already asking like several times. Then the girl will realize, oh, okay, it's really from Tanaka. I better uh, expedite the document for you so that you can get back to him quicker. Yeah, this was the bright side. And but if you already realize the interviewer from a company is like lying on some aspect before you step into the office for an interview you browse the craft store or some like uh, some other website that a lot of interviewees will, will share their comments on the company or the, the OB OG the notes will already left the company will leave a message or comment on this companies you know uh, craft store Oh, you can refer it. And you already browse the comments, and you know most of the people who left the company left for a negative comment on the company, but you already accept the interview. Uh, I think that you're still better to visit them to verify by yourself. You try to prepare yourself with some key questions. Of course, if they want to lie to you, you cannot stop them. Or you can evaluate in your mind. But if you are desperately want to have a job and this is the only shot you can have, personal opinion, I still ask you to accept it. If you need money. So uh, I think in management, there's a theory called Maslow's theory, and there are different needs, hierarchically. If you really need money to have your needs met daily and you really running out of money you better have to accept this job but no matter, in my experience i think no matter how bad this company is as long as you receive your money on time that's enough you just don't you try to don't give a uh, ask for uh, to the boss and anything, and you have to try to protect yourself. If they want you to do anything illegally, and it's obviously against the law, you just try to tell them straight forward to their face, I cannot do this kind of thing, it's illegal. You don't try to lie, you want to make friends with them, you want to try, you try to be honest, 
uh, a person with that you want to be inside a circle, so you just get along with that and just do the illegal things for a company or everything. Eventually, they will push all the obligation to you. The same thing. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Okay. Okay. Uh, I, uh, he said you interviewed some. Junior, uh, yeah. Before. Uh, so I want to ask: When you watch a CV, what do you think is vital, and what do you think is less important? Uh, yeah, I have seen quite some funny one, and I think it's a Taiwanese character. They compose a CV, but they just finish it. When they finish the last words, they think they finished. They don't actually check. So typo is really important. When I see a typo, I see what kind of, what are you thinking, you, why you don't check? Mm -hmm. If you cannot check your CV and you say to a lot of employers, then everyone see, the first thing came to my mind is like, okay, you're going to make a mistake, uh, especially a big one, because you never look back, you never check. This is a thing. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, uh, I'll read through the summary, I pretty like to read the summary. How you describe yourself in a, a couple sentences actually really matters, because a lot of uh, those youngsters who just graduated from schools, they will list a lot of things on their CV. But you know, we have job to do every day, and I have to go for drink with my friends after work. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the CV. So I will write to it. And to be honest, I also watch your photo, whether you see friendly or not. <laughs> if you want to apply a job, I didn't make you before that you have a photo like which will make him to twist in your face or something that is really weird. So try to smile, have some more trial on the photos and <laughs> select the best one and attach on the CV is quite important. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much about that. I think most important is your qualification. Like, now to be honest, I will see your school. Mm -hmm. So that's why I interviewed a Tensu University guy. Mm -hmm. There's a key sponsor to the university. So I think, okay, maybe he's smart enough not to make a mistake. Yeah. But, Eventually, it really matters during the interview. Or sometimes I want to do. Oh, actually, how how I get the job in RGE is not because they scout me. I applied before, and they keep my profile in the database. Okay. And after they they approach me. Mm -hmm. So, from me, I think my suggestion is just. Apply massively, no matter what, because just one click away, you just click it. No matter what, you just click it. You click it, you have the chance to interview with them. When you don't click it, then you just uh, pause on the internet. So my suggestion is to apply a lot, but you don't feel frustrated because you apply a lot and no one gets back to you. It's normal. You just keep applying, keep annoying them to notice your existence. Well, personal opinion uh, is not the uh, correct way, not the perfect way to do. You still have to refer to a lot of people's experience or something, not just mine. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. I see a CV is from a guy, but I think he's an army. 
no judgment, but his uh, uh, name, Singapore is like CC Boya, and Yang Yang Chang, they call it our name. But uh, they put a lot of flowers <laughs> on the CD. Then when we print it out, it's like flower, uh, the Fu Sui Ying, outside of the CD. They actually it stands out. But my boss is like a 60 years old guy and he say, what is this? I'm like that. How come I need to meet him? I don't like this kind of guy. It's a man with a C, has a C with flower on it. I'm not going to interview him now. You just go, go along. That's what, how you say. But, so you have to realize something like, you think you're doing the right thing. And this is the trend. But some company they still have very old fashioned people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then you just consider big lot of effort. So that's why I say uh, getting a job is also like a point there. Like you swiping the finger. Some people they don't select, they're just swiping right all the time. And you can't match it, but actually he doesn't like he or she doesn't like you. Mm. You just like swiping all the time. And you got a match, and you go, and he, he feel he or she feel okay, no, then I just I like, hang out with you. Then you feel like oh maybe this is a good one, but actually it's not. But some people they didn't pay attention, they pass it into this part that they didn't have the chance, you didn't have the chance to see the light. So this is my memory of the law. So this actually no fairness. Or justice, a lot of times it really matters your luck, to be honest. Mm. So before this speech, I told Nagasawa san that, okay, I'm about to kill their dreams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you will try your best because in my class, I'm not, I'm not also the one who is really good as student and studying, so I'm not really the one who's always being so positive and a great seed on trying to make something happen. But it all like accumulate from the environment I've been to like I I feel like I want to go abroad, but this time I don't want to go to America or Europe or about Japan. But actually before I started start starting in Japan, I never been to Japan. Mm. So the day I arrived in Japan, there's no Haneda airport. There's only Narita. Mm -hmm. And back to the time, there's no smartphone, no internet on the mobile, and it's my first day. So I print out all the map mm -hmm. and the, the train, uh, transit map. I just use a map and, you know, I, take on, I took a bus and arrived at uh, Ikebukuro station and have to transit to a train. You know, Ikebukuro station got by more than a thousand platforms. Which one is the cycle line? Mm -hmm. Then which way is to my door? Or well, I still can recall the first day I arrived in Japan. It's like nightmare. Mm -hmm. I arrived at Narita in around three or four o'clock in the afternoon. I hit my home eleven. Wow. I couldn't find a way. Mm -hmm. And the map from the agency, actually I don't know how they printed, but it's like like the opposite way. Right. So yeah. after I <laughs> arrived at the station, I have to walk to the dorm, but the way I had it actually is the opposite way. Mm -hmm. And I can't find a way, I, and I didn't speak Japanese at all. When I speak to a person in English, they would just run away. <laughs> yeah, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, can, may I ask about, like, do you, what do you think, what is the, when is the right time to heal about the salary after you, I mean like after you go to the company and you do that job for a certain time and like when should you say to heal? You mean a negotiation during the interview after you finish I mean, the last I mean one? Salary. The salary? After you already get the job and you work, uh, for, work for a year yeah. and how you justify for mm -hmm. a raise? Uh, I think it depends what kind of company you work for. Because in Taiwan, uh, the boss will always tell you we, we 
we are not making any money this year. <laughs> Believe me, because my, my dad is also a boss. So this is how he does. Yeah. Actually, to be honest, compare among Taiwan, Singapore, and Japan, I think, respectively, each of them has their good side and bad side. But considering the salary, Taiwan is really paying quite low. But like in Japan, for even the the Japan companies, Taiwan branch, they just do it like hierarchical. They call it in Japan, they call it Nepo and Nepo joints. Like you, you hit the second year, the equivalent is like two thousand Taiwanese dollar, and another year two thousand two thousand Taiwanese dollar. And if you hit a certain year, they will give you like more 20% that you will be entitled as a, a junior manager or something. This is how they do it. You don't get to justify for yourself. Mm -hmm. But in Singapore, it depends on the performance you met last year. Uh, so they will have an appraiser. So you can talk to your boss. They will tell, they will, the boss will tell you, okay, your, your bonus for last year is uh, this and we will entitle you another how many percentage of increment for the following months until next appraiser. Then you can try to discuss with them. Uh, usually on that you are very talented and capable person and have more than 10 years of uh, experience in a certain industry. I don't think it's possible for you to justify. So, I mean, after you graduate, maybe in the next five, six years, you are the one being chosen. You are not going to choose anything. So, accumulate your capability, accumulate your strengths and your advantage, and try to learn some more things, some more new things, or pick up a second habit on everything. Anything you can think about is quite important to improve yourself instead of to instead of being too keen on like asking for agreement for the next five percent or ten percent because what I can think about is that your first job if you are well paid maybe forty thousand dollars dollar I think nowadays most of the company here are only willing to pay this kind of amount. But next year even his will, the company is willing to increase your salary to, like, let's say, fifty thousand. Does it change? No. Because around my friends, if you're make, if you're making less than one hundred thousand a month, actually, if you have a wife, have a car, have the house loan to pay with two kids, one hundred thousand is already too tight. So. You're a fresh graduate, you're getting 40, 50, 60, 70, it doesn't change. It changed significantly when you are already someone who will approach you on LinkedIn. You have to make sure you hit the kind of level to have someone look for you instead of you look for someone else. But of course, if you feel like you're not learning any new things and all the things you're doing is repeating only, you can, of course, you can seek for other chances. And during the interview, you try to increase your expectation about the salaries and whether they accept or not, they're going to match your uh, demand or not. It's a part opportunity. But I think the first or two or even third jobs you're going to have after you graduate, it's more important about accumulating your 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 core competence. Whether you are a good uh, good employee to keep. And one thing uh, related to the CV stuff, I think when I look to the CV, the guy, uh, how long does it last for a couple, the uh, last two jobs, maybe two or three? It's quite important. He graduated from Tertiary University and the first job you only do like six months. And the second job only eight months. And the third job only nine months. Usually I don't think he's stable. He doesn't know what he's 
um, going to have, going to do, he may be not able to ask the correct question during the interviews because he has no, he has no idea about what he's going to have in the future. That's why he quits suddenly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you were a junior in my class, if you were a senior, if you were graduating one year, what kind of work, what kind of industry would you choose? For example, we don't have any capital to start a business by now. So yeah. what, is, what would be your first choice? If I am a classmate? Yeah. Oh. I heard you study in communication, right? Then yeah. mm, maybe while I was uh, I'm a student here, I'll try to find some internship no matter what it costs. Because in Singapore, I think in Japan then it's not popular when I was there. It's not popular to have an internship. Mm -hmm. Unless it's a consulting firm mm -hmm. and you are already an MBA student, then maybe someone will find an internship to do during the summer vacation or winter vacation. Mm -hmm. But in Singapore, it's quite important you have this kind of internship. Some there, some of them will ask you to stay for a month, uh, a month or maybe six months, or maybe a year, mm -hmm. and they are not going to pay you mm -hmm. in Singapore. That's quite a uh, uh, bitter fact. Mm -hmm. And I actually heard from a friend he just married recently, and he shared a story like his wife, he had an internship with a company when, he, when she was a senior student, and she was expecting the company will offer her, but instead of offering her, they asked her to do, another inter, uh, do the internship for another year, and she did it. And they say the second year of internship are going to pay you at just quite a limited amount of the salary. Mm -hmm. And she thought she's going to be a permanent employee after the second year of internship, but eventually they didn't offer her a permanent role. They just suddenly asked her to leave. So you have to know in Singapore, this is really competitive environment mm -hmm. to get a job there. Like when I was in Japan, it's also like this. Ten, uh, seven out of ten of the foreign students want to stay in Japan for working. Only four of them can get a job, no matter what kind of job. But only one of them can last for more than five years. So you have to consider about the cultural differences, the business environment, like you are stepping into the society while all the things so prosperous, or you step into the society well, there's a coronavirus. They also matters. You can only consider it just your bad luck. Yeah. But sooner or later, you are going to see this kind of incident coming. Like when I was a, a newbie to a society, that's a financial money, and your turn, that's a pandemic. It happens all the time. So you can. I think the thing I was saying, you can just try. And if you're really keen on doing some marketing thing, you find some PR company, you try to ask them what's the requirement, you try to get a, a person who is willing to talk to you. Uh, I believe most of them, they are too busy to talk to you. But you just try, you have to try to stand out. You can watch a lot of Hollywood movies, those who are looking for industrial action. This is, a, this is real. A lot of people, they, they they spend a lot of efforts just to get a simple role with this junior or something. Like when I was working for RG Group, they all the MA, we call management associate. Uh, they just we just hire them and we told them they are going to rotate from business team to business team and to logistics as well. We're going to rotate them. But it can eventually we did it. But it's not my decision, it's a management decision. And all of that, four of them, they came from the US. The US is a national university of Singapore. And you know, in Singapore, there are students that study for, they study really, really hard to get into the uh, US. Actually, the academic environment in Singapore is extremely competitive, like Shanghai, it's the same. And 
they only receive three thousand and six hundred for their salary, monthly salary, and they are doing by when I when I was in need, I would ask them like Joshua, go copy this. This is how I did to them. But we are also busy, and you guys didn't know anything. You guys are not going to be distressed in the next six months. You are going to learn, but no one is going to teach you. But you have to find out the chances to learn. But you know, those students from the US, they feel they can. I'm the first place when I was studying at Raffles Institute. Raffles Institute is a private school in Singapore, which only the outperforming students were be invited to enroll to the school. And if you keep complaining about oh, oh the senior guy, I tell them the chubby one always oh, asked me to copy the stuff, asked me to make the coffee, asked me to run some errands or contact the logistic team. He's not teaching me. But when I ask you to talk to the logistic or when I give you in every email I am sending and receiving, have you found any question or curious stuff? You would like to know. Have you ever uh, approached me to ask a question? And he said, Hey, we are always busy. How can I ask you? Hey, you look at me, you found me, I'm, 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 I'm preoccupied with something that you, you just stay there and never ask. You know he's busy, you know he's not going to answer you or anything, and you stop. This is your fault. So you find a company you're really interested, you try your best to contact them, try to attract their attention, to receive their anything. If you really want something, you are willing to sacrifice, not going to get paid for your internship, or you're willing to stay with them for even just wrong some errors. This very hardcore truth that you have to keep in your mind when you find a job. We I think the, everyone's feeling is very down. <laughs> Chill out. Any other questions? No? Yeah. Okay, the last one. So, uh, can I ask, is it important to, like, now the university score to get the job? Huh? Is it, is it important to, like, our university score, GPA, to, like, yeah. get the oh. job? The grade in school. <laughs> I think it's important when you're going to in, when you try to get into some MNC when they are very selective on your academic background mm -hmm. then your GPA really matters but my case uh, like I say I was once failed by three or four subjects in one semester actually it turns off the average GPA on my four years only less than three. Wow. Yeah. That's bad. <laughs> wow. I'm still here. I'm still quite comfortable without doing a formal job. Cool. cool. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, the third thing. When I want to get a job, I want to find something in Spanish because I want to pursue for further study. So uh, I want to find something in Spanish, no matter what it is. So I will actually accidentally jump and walk out. It's a Mitsui Osaka line. It's a, in Japan, it's recorded show saying Mitsui. It's a shipping line uh, in Japan, which is also the top three. Yeah. So that's how I get back. I went to Japan for Japanese learning and enrolled to an MBA. I, in, during those two years in MBA course, I studied quite hard. I can be honest, I, I, I have lived in Japan for six years, and within my whole life until this year, I never been to Hokkaido. Because when I was in Japan, I was like, super busy studying, you know, like learning from Ali, where I to get everyone qualified. It's, it takes a lot of efforts. Mm -hmm. So my first year is I, I always like home school, home school, home school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So GPA matters. So you can show the interviewer like you actually put your efforts on the things that you were asked to do. Your student, your your job is studying, and you're actually studying. Yeah. But even if you have some uh, mistaken failure, like you wanted to have more funding, then you 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 fail on some sub subjects. You still can take more courses in the third year or fourth year to try to make a uh, make an effort to, to change that. Yeah. And when you get a chance to interview, when they ask your GPS score, and you say the truth, and they say, wow, how come you suck like this up? They can say, okay, I have some bad judgment, but you can see my uh, yearly score in my third year and four year. I really try to make some efforts to change that. You can also say that it's also a very good excuse. I actually use it. Yeah. Any further questions? I think it depends on the role. I think the master degree doesn't really reflect to the job while you were mm. you are a junior. But when someday in the future you're going to be a senior manager or you're going to pursue even further higher to become the top manager of the of the company, I don't know what will happen in the next ten or twenty years, but currently you can see all the top management in some big company, they have very like, pretty academic background and they, most of them they have a BA degree. Yeah. This is what's happening now, but I'm not I'm, I'm not sure about the future. But it also depends on you. For me, a BA degree helped me to earn about two years uh, having fun in Tokyo. <laughs> of course, I also started very hard, and I also like you know fly back and forth in between Japan and Taiwan. And my friends they are working super hard in Taipei, and every time I was just like I'm going back to Taiwan, Taiwan, like this kind of thing. So, so it depends on how you look in the future. And some people they are maybe a little bit tight on their budget, maybe the family cannot really support uh, your pursuit of further study, then you have to think about another way to get it done. But even if you couldn't, then it doesn't matter. It's not going to be a symbol of failure in your life. It's just changing another path to pursue your dreams. Yeah. Okay. You guys are good. No further cuts after this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Is there any preferable skill for new graduate students in order to get the job this year? Um, this year? You mean internship or a formal job? A uh, formal job. After formal job? Year. Where are you coming from? Uh, Thailand. Thailand? You want to stay in Thailand? Um, I'm thinking about that. Uh, yeah. which, where do you want to go for after you graduate? Honestly, like, I found myself that I don't really interested in communication field that much. Uh -huh. So I want to pursue myself in something like um, business developers or something like uh -huh. project coordinator. But uh -huh. I found that the language is a huge barrier for me too. So uh, here or in other um, countries? Um, if um, project coordinator is of uh course -huh. here, it's more. Oh, then you improve your Mandarin? Hmm? Then you improve your Mandarin? Yeah, that's <laughs> what I'm working. People here, every day, just, every day you just follow them. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm working. You just some more, like this kind of things. Yeah, I'm working on it now. So. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Hope you get it. But it's like, is there any preferable skill that... Uh, Project coordinator. I think because as a coordinator, well, mostly they will ask you to do a lot of trivial things. 
you will find out you are doing a lot of atomy stuff eventually. And the uh, main stuff means like when the customer came, when the visitor came to your office, you also want to ask you to serve a tea to them or ask you to do some paperwork for them, which is actually standing in your job scope. And whether they find you as a potential, if this company is going to have some projects in Thailand in the future, maybe they see your potential, they are going to have you, even you not a very uh, okay I'm not going to choose the words you're not going you're not good at your Mandarin there's no choosing so it really depends how the interviewer see you but before knowing who is an interviewer and you want to settle you want to have a job in Taiwan as a project coordinator I think the Mandarin would be the first thing for you to do but I think Project coordinator mostly. If you want to find a company here, there are a lot of wind power company. They are having office here because Taiwan is promoting wind power, and mostly they are European. And they also came along with a lot of like engineering companies and all all the relevant company that in this supply chain they were going to set up their office. Mostly they already have and they may need a person who is good at English more than Mandarin. So you just evaluate what's your chance to get in one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh. Yeah, come on. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been standing for two oh, hours yeah. and I'm still asking. <laughs> okay. Ask. Uh, <laughs> I don't classify my weight on distressing <laughs> in which nationality of the company I'm working for, but usually, uh, as you can see, I eat. <laughs> yeah. uh, or I do have some drinks. Yeah, last night I actually haven't drinks my my classmates. Yeah. And they ask me what I'm going to do because I'm going to hit another nightclub. I say I'm better going home. <laughs> and I say, they say, what are you going to do? You don't have a job. And I say, tomorrow I'm going to give a speech. They say, to whom? To to uh, Yenzhen University, to all the junior guys. How come the, the teacher must be crazy? <laughs> <to ask him. laughs> the other thing, he has quite an to call. Yeah. I think everyone differs, so you have to try to find your own way. Mm -hmm. Some people will be swiping on pictures or go watching movies and everything. Yeah. Okay, we're well, good. me the most within my career? Uh, the money. <laughs> <laughs> and the bonus. <laughs> we in now in Taiwan, some of this comes on a small scale culture in company. They have their own courtyard. And they are selling to some small scale users. They have their own boiler to generate the uh, electricity, but actually it's illegal. But some company they are doing this kind of job. So, but the demand from the small users are actually quite little, like a couple hundred thousand a, year, uh, a month. So I try to connect this kind of small coal trading company with the, the miners in Indonesia and Australia, and this coal broker. And broker, I don't need to sign any contract. I just sign a contract as a brokerage, brokerage uh, agreement with the buyers or the sellers. I just connect them and I can receive some broker fee. And usually it comes as a like one ton, uh, one dollar per ton. Yeah. So, yeah. So, to me, I think the career that I value the most is still money. Yeah, but everyone prefers that. Huh? Okay. Right. That's correct.
Great. So thank you very much. For talking honestly, sharing your beer experiences, and encouraging our students. Thank you very much. All right. So we can take to the sure. I'm trying to get a 